in our lecture on numerical methods, um, we discussed the Monte Carlo method. So we had some convergence results. And we talked about uh, Monte Carlo integration before. Huh? So Monte Carlo integration here is that we can approximate the inter integral uh, from uh, say uh, zero to one f of x dx by uh, say a sum over some sample points. So xi uh, uniform uh, drawing. So that motivated uh, <clears throat> the question uh, how to generate uh, xi. the sequence xi and we had some algorithm which generated numbers that looked quite random, so, so pseudo random numbers. And uh, today uh, I would like to uh, continue a little bit on this and uh, discuss the discrepancy and the coxma Lafka inequality. And we have some uh, surprising result here. Um, so first observation, I would like to uh, stress is if you look here at our Monte Carlo integral, so for a given sequence, so this sum, sum of f of xi, yeah, then actually it does not matter that the xi occur in a random order. Yeah? So actually we could even sort them. Yeah? So and the sum would still be the same. So in fact, we could sort the sequence and the Monte Carlo integral would remain the same. Now, apart from, since you uh, saw our other lecture on uh, computer arithmetic, um, reordering could introduce some difference in a rounding error, but we have an algorithm that uh, does error correction. So reordering this sequence uh, would not change the integral. So our sequence could be sorted. So the randomness actually does not maybe matter so much. Yeah. So with respect to the randomness, we had two aspects. Though the first aspect was, it was a little bit disappointing because our convergence rate uh, was given only in probability. But then last time we saw that the randomness also is a feature because the randomness allowed to add more points, additional points, and every additional point contributed or improved the accuracy because the probability that we hit the same sample point again in every dimension uh, is uh, zero. Yeah? So in any dimension is zero. So it contributed to any dimensions improvement. And this was the reason that we poke up this curse of dimension. So actually the randomness was also big feature to uh, uh, breaking up, uh, to break up the curse of dimension. So let me make a small remark here. Yeah? So either uh, the randomness is good, other the, uh, then uh, we don't like it because uh, our convergence holds only in probability. And here we see actually we can sort the sequence. So small remark. Um, so our Monte Carlo approximation, f of xi, yeah, so we look at this, which approximates the integral from zero to one f of x dx, say we are in one dimension. So let's start here at zero with the sequence, so like we do it in the computer. Um, so let's look at this for two different cases. So the first case is, our pseudo random number generator. So I have xi is sampling, so capital X random variable of omega for i id random variables. So xi uh, uniform on zero one. 
So, for example, well, our pseudo random number generator, which was math.random. Or xi is if we take mess and twister. Uh, then it was get next double. So we had some random number generators that could generate this sequence. And then I would like to take another sequence. Well, since we can order this, we'll take a sequence which is very structured, just, just i divided by n. Yeah. So for i from zero to n minus one. Yeah, so you have an equi distance uh, discretization of this interval. Yeah, one, two, three, four, five, six. These uh, these points. And <clears throat> for this motivation, let me shut, just uh, show you this in a small uh, coding session. Yeah. Uh, we had this example before, but maybe just uh, repeat it. It's, it's very quick. So I create a new uh, class. Uh, I would like to have uh, a main method where we do our experiment. Uh, let's call this package here, um, say random numbers, and let's call it the class quasi random number experiments. So maybe we do some more experiments here. And um, in this code, let's try the first example. Um, I like to integrate some function with some sample point. So let's define the number of sample points. Let's say we take 100 or 1000 sample points. Then I would like to integrate some function. So let's define the function. Um, uh, what is it? Double unary operator. Yes, some function. So our function, what function should we take? Maybe we take one which we can integrate analytically, uh, x to the power of three. Yeah? So um, if f of x is uh, x to the power of three, uh, then the um, integral from zero to one f of x uh, dx is uh, one over four. So this is 0 0.25. Yeah? So we know the analytic solution. So let's write this down. So the integral analytic is 0.25. So now let's do the Monte Carlo integration with our pseudo random number uh, generator. Um, so I like to use this Java stream API here. Yeah, we did this before. So let's generate um, a double stream um, of random numbers. So I have to import the double stream class. And so I write here uh, double stream generate and as a generator I use the mass and twister. So let's take mass and twister here um, and we take one with a fixed uh, Monte Carlo seat here for example one or any other number and then I from this uh, stream I would like to uh, just take the first uh, 1000 points, so limit the stream to number of uh, sample points. Okay, so that's uh, our random number sequence. And then uh, the integral, the Monte Carlo integral would be um, evaluate the function on these numbers. So uh, random numbers uh, map uh, the function. And from that, we need the sum, sum over all those guys, and then we divide by the uh, number of sample points. Okay, and we can print it. 
<clears throat> so the um, integral pseudo random number generator um, is this result. And maybe let's also print the error. So the error is with a little bit of space. It's just the difference of this value and our analytic value. So our analytic value, okay. So, and a little plus here. So maybe I move this here a little bit to the side. So we see everything on one page here. Yeah? So that's what we print. And let's run this uh, class here. Okay, so we have an error of 10 to the minus four. If we increase the points, 10,000, 100, 1 million, if we increase the number of points, uh, still 10 to the minus four, just one more. Okay, very slow convergence. 10 to the minus six. Huh? Okay, there's slow convergence. Actually, 1000 is surprisingly good. 100, 0 0.01. Uh, so 10,000 was surprisingly good. Yeah. Okay, so that was our Monte Carlo integrator. And now, as I told here, I would like to generate the same with a sequence that is very structured. Yeah. So let's call this uh, using quasi random number generator. Yeah? So I will explain this later. So my double stream um, of random numbers quasi is just, I take an integer stream. So a stream, a sequence of integers. So in stream dot range from zero to number of points number of sample points. So I have to import this here. So range is uh, zero included, number of sample points excluded. Uh, so exactly what we like to have here. Then I do a map to double. I convert this to a double function. So the integer is converted to uh, double i divided by number of sample points. So that's now a very structured sequence and I repeat the code from above. So I'm a bit lazy, I just copy it and replace the sequence here, random numbers, map functions. So now random number quasi and we call this new value integral quasi MC and let's print the integral quasi MC. Okay, so now the code is here done. And you see for 1000 points, approximately the same, uh, the same error. Okay, so let's increase the number of points, uh, 10,000. So we have a 10 to the minus five here. This one is getting better. 100,000, 10 to the minus six, 1 million. 10 to the minus seven, 10 million, 10 to the minus eight. Yeah? You, so you see this guy here converges much faster. Yeah? Uh, so actually using a sequence, which is completely structured, yeah? so ordered, so like this one here, So n equals six. So we have the sequence zero, one divided by six, two divided by six, and so on until five divided by six. 
Yeah, this works even better. Actually, you know that the Monte Carlo convergence rate is square root of n. Yeah, and to some extent, you see this square root of n, and it looks as if the convergence rate of this method is actually one divided by n, yeah? Okay, so we have a 10 to the minus eight, yeah? Actually something more in the region of 10 to the minus seven, and we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, yeah? 10 to the seven points, yeah? So, and this guy is approximately in the region of the square root, okay? Um, so it looks as if the second method has a convergence rate of one divided by n, yeah? so much better. So <clears throat> since this sequence works too, it's not random, actually there's the question, which property is of interest here? Yeah? So which property of the sequence xi is relevant to get a good approximation. Okay, so remember the randomness was helpful to break up curves of dimension and also to improve continuously by adding more points. But uh, with respect to the convergence rate, it appears that we have found something better. So then if I go back to the code, uh, a while ago in another session, we talked about how to generate vectors of um, random drawings. So uh, the sequence of random vectors. So we wrote this small class here, or we discussed this small class here. So we have a one dimensional random number generator. And if we would like to have a sequence of vectors, so a double array, where the first element is the length of the sequent, sequence, and then the second um, index is the element of the vector, then we do this by just going over all elements of the sequence and then going over all components and just populate the entries one by another with the random number. And we had a small program to plot this. So if we run this uh, little program, we can plot, for example, in two dimensions. So 1000 points, in two dimensions, and we got this picture here, okay? So that was our picture. So let's plot this again for say just 100 points. If I plot now 100 points, the picture looks like this. So we have fewer points, so this picture, and If you take a look at this picture, you see that there are certain regions where you do not have any points. Yeah? So we have a random samples. So we have here a large empty space. And for other points, we have, for example, some clusters. Yeah? There are two points very close together. Here you have three points here, uh, maybe you have also some kind of uh, line. Yeah, So this looks like a little line here. Yeah? So you have some clusters of points. So I now consider that we integrate a two-dimensional function, a function of x and y in this uh, graph. And the function is say, for example, uh, zero, everywhere, except here in this region, the function is one. If you integrate this function, which is one in this region, then 
uh, the Monte Carlo integral will be zero because all the other points are zero and the points do not recognize this area. If you look at the two integral, integrating an indicator function is just the area of the support. Yeah, so um, it's just the area of this space, meaning that our error is the size of this empty space. So for this application, a function which is zero everywhere and one in this region, the Monte Carlo integral has an error, which is of the size of this empty space, which means we would like to have that this space is not too large. Okay, actually we would like to have the points quite evenly distributed. And this is exactly what I did in this little coding example that I generated a sequence which was quite evenly distributed. Actually, actually the equidistribution uh, of uh, all the points. Yeah, So the distance to the neighbor is always the same. Um, so it appears as if this is an important concept to reduce the error. Uh, measure empty spaces, measure clusters. Okay, and the concept that does this is the discrepancy. And let's take a look at the definition. So this is the definition of the object uh, which we need. Uh, and we will have a nice uh, little uh, theorem from that. And uh, I would like to, to read the definition and explain the definition uh, to you so you get an intuition of what is going on here. Yeah? So we start with some sequence. Yeah? For example, our uh, random number sequence. So the, the thing which is later than our random number sequence, uh, we immediately start in D dimensions. So X1 to Xn is in 0, 1, D, yeah, the unit hypercube. And then we define the discrepancy D of this sequence. So it's a function of all those points by doing the following. So let's maybe draw a little uh, picture here on top. So this is our interval from zero to say uh, one here. Okay, then we have a few sample points in this interval. So let's have a few sample points. There's one here, maybe there's one here, and maybe we have two here. Yeah? So we have some empty space and some clusters. Okay, then we take the supremum over all intervals. Yeah? So A and B are two points in our domain 0, 1. So um, in my picture, for example, this guy here is A and this guy here is B. Uh, I take all A and B, so I, for example, could also be that we have an A here and B here, yeah? And then we have A, B, which define an interval, so that one here. And in this interval, we just check if a point of our sequence is in this interval. If it is in this interval, it's defining this set, and from this set here, sorry, from this set here, I take the number of points that lie in this interval. Yeah, so this is this definition here. So I take the number of points that lie in this interval, I count the number of points in this interval defined by A and B. So that would be zero points here, uh, two points there, and then we divide by the number of points in our sequence, yeah? So total number of points in our sequence. So here in this um, example, so let's uh, specify this. This is the example n equals four, d equals one. So in one dimension, we have four points in this example. Uh, we count zero divided by four, two divided by four. So it's the fraction, yeah? It's the percentage uh, of um, points we find in this interval. How many points would you expect 
in average if you have maybe many points. So since the sequence x1 to xn is a uniform or should be a uniform distributed sequence yeah, in the Monte Carlo applic application, the expectation to find points in this interval actually is just the size of the interval. So this is just the Lebesgue measure of this interval. So that's the term here, the Lebesgue measure of our interval. So this is, say, the expectation expectation of the percentage of points in the interval a b yeah so for um d equals one this is just the length of the interval so it's just b minus a and in general it's if the interval uh, is a cube, yeah, so then this is just the Cartesian product of A1, B1, the interval, and A2, B2 up to AD, BD, then this measure here is just the area or the volume of this cube. Yeah, so the product of the edges. Okay, so this is the size of the interval or the area or the volume of AB. So that's the blue part is what we would like to have. And the orange divided by the green is what we actually count. And then we look at the difference. So how much is the distribution of the point different from what we would expect from an equidistributed sequence? Okay, so that's the discrepancy. Okay, and it will be large if we have large empty spaces yeah, because then we count very few points but since we have a large space we would we have a large area it will be large also if we have a cluster because then we have maybe a small area a small lambda but we count many many points Okay, there is the small uh, generalization or small uh, alternative uh, definition. Actually, it's not, not, not a generalization, it's the opposite. Um, uh, we can define the so-called star discrepancy uh, by, sorry, by just taking A equal to zero. That is all intervals start at the, left end point, yeah, at the origin of our uh, cube. So this is a, a small uh, simplification, yeah, so you see the only inter integral uh, intervals uh, which you look at are the one from zero to b. Okay, actually you can show that this is also um, a measure to uh, measure this property because you can show that um, the star discrepancy is always lower than the discrepancy. Of course, we are taking the supremum over a larger set. If we take, uh, if we allow that the left endpoint can change. But you can also prove, yeah, since you can uh, cut an integ integral from A to B in, take a look at from zero to A and from zero to B, yeah. Um, you can also prove that uh, the um, discrepancy is bounded by two to the power of d, the star discrepancy. This is a constant which depends on the dimension, but actually it does not have a curse of dimension because it's not 
it does not depend on n. Yeah? So it's just a fixed constant for a fixed dimension. Um, and if we increase the number of points, uh, this, this constant does not increase. So it's actually enough to look at the simpler expression, the star discrepancy. Okay, so now the claim is that this measure, the discrepancy is helpful in uh, characterizing, um, characterizing a property of the sequence, uh, which will later be important for the convergence. So before we come to this, um, maybe let's develop a little bit of understanding uh, or deeper understanding for, the, for this function. Yeah. So how can we calculate the discrepancy? Actually, there is an elementary way of calculating the discrepancy because we can replace the supremum by a maximum. Okay. Um, So what's going on here? You see, this is just the star, the star discrepancy. So I'm just looking at intervals starting in zero, ending in B. Maybe just look at our example again with a one dimensional in, uh, uh, case. Yeah? So we have some sample points between zero and one. So maybe we have a sample point here, sample point here. Yeah. So what was our example? Yeah. So maybe two sample points here. Okay. Then the star discrepancy is taking an interval starting in zero with some left point. Yeah. So for example, say uh, some right point B here and it's counting how many points are in this set. Yeah? So there are zero points. Okay, so if you go back, we take the difference of counting the number of points and the Lebesgue measure so the area or the length of the interval. Actually, we take also, of course, the absolute value because when I, when I mentioned we have too few points, yeah, we are below, yeah, it's negative. If I mentioned we have too many points, we are above. Yeah, what we measure is the distance, the absolute value. So the, dis the, the discrepancy should be close to zero if we are evenly distributed. Okay, and then taking this to supremum. So how does this look here in our um, example? So the function which is inside is the difference of counting the number of points and the length of the interval. Okay, so the length of the interval grows linear, okay? And then suddenly we count a point. Yeah? So at the moment where we count a point, we jump down because now we subtract yeah, from the length of the interval one divided by n. So the jump here is one divided by n. Then the length of the interval is growing again and we reach here another point yeah, and we jump down by one divided by n. Okay, and then we grow linearly. Uh, maybe up to here and we jump down by one divided by n, maybe only here, then here, one divided by n and so on. And in the end, it's the whole interval, which is one, and it's n divided by n, which is also one. Yeah? So we we are here. So and every just every such jump here is maybe 
of the same size, one divided by n. Okay, so that's the function. And what's now the discrepancy? Actually, the discrepancy is the largest distance from the horizontal line. Yeah. So actually, we would like to be close to the horizontal line. So for our set here, it's actually enough to um, evaluate these points here. Take the absolute value. So that's the distance of the horizontal line. So what we do is the following. Um, now here it is written in full generality for D dimensions. So actually we define a set here. So this set X um, is given by our sequence. In addition, one additional point here, the one. So we have all our um, XIs. Um, and um, I'm sorry, 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 that was uh, the wrong mark. So we take all our XIs and we take another additional point, which is one here. So in D dimension, I do this for every dimension. So I define a set gamma J, which contains for every component of the vector, the corresponding component of the ice element Xij, and in addition, one additional point at the end, which is one. So actually gamma j is, if you think of your sequence of vectors, um, maybe I just write this here. Yeah? So if you think of your sequence of uh, vectors like that. Okay, then this gamma j is just a cut, a horizontal cut here look taking all the components and in the end i always i also take one additional point which is uh, one additional number which is one and from these uh, elements i now construct the cartesian uh, product uh, so the cartesian product which contains all possible combinations of the components uh. so um, if uh, your point uh, 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 x2 yeah, has in the first component one third, and the point um, say uh, x7 has in, this, uh, in the uh, second component uh, one over five. Yeah? So then the point one over three, one over five is also part of the set gamma. In one dimension, actually, it's just the green points here. It's just all the points of our sequence plus the last one. Okay, so, and what we do is we evaluate now on these points, what is the Lebesgue measure of an interval from zero to this point y of this set gamma. Yeah? So we take here the set y in gamma. Then we take the interval from zero to y, y not included. Okay. So we take the interval from zero to y why not included? Let me remove this. This is the interval from zero to y not included, which would correspond to this point here in our discrepancy function and the interval from zero to y, y included which corresponds, so, and then we count how many points do we have in this interval, uh, which corresponds here in our picture 
to taking the closed interval to this point. Okay, and we calculate the distance to the lambda, which is the distance to the horizontal line in our picture. Yeah? So actually lambda is going linearly. Yeah? So that's, that's then the, the distance to the horizontal line. Okay, so um, that's enough. Yeah, so actually the proof, maybe this is kind of graphic proof. Yeah, so these are the extreme points and it's enough to evaluate our discrepancy at these extreme uh, points here. So, and for this set, the discrepancy is this size here. So we find the discrepancy of this set, which is this size. This is our star discrepancy. Okay, so. So you see the star discrepancy is actually not the largest empty space you find, yeah? because the largest empty space you find uh, would be, maybe I have to take another color. Let's take some gray color. This is the largest empty space which we find. Yeah? Um, this is not the star discrepancy, but the star discrepancy is actually bigger than one half of the largest empty space. Yeah? Because the best thing is that you cut this with your, with your linear line into two halves. Yeah? This is the best. So the intuition is quite correct. The largest empty space defines the discrepancy. Actually could also be the other case that we have the largest cluster because at the largest cluster you have that you jump down here by one divided by n then at the next point you also jump down by one divided by n and if you jump too often you get too far from the horizontal line so the largest cluster could also be the the uh, guy that drives the discrepancy Okay, so you see that this measure, this uh, D-star discrepancy is small in both cases. If we, so both, both conditions have to be met. Uh, there should not be large empty spaces and there should not be uh, uh, clusters on small spaces. Okay, so um, now we have some uh, intuition uh, for this. So how many points do we need uh, to uh, calculate this? So since um, I needed x, i, j, uh, so we need all our points. I also needed here one additional point at the end, this guy. So plus one, then in D dimensions, I need to combine all the guys to get all the, um, uh, um, all the corresponding uh, rectangles uh, or, or, or cubes. Yeah? So in D dimension, we have this to the power of D. Oops. To the power of D here and then we have to include and exclude the point so we have to perform two tests two calculations so i get another two here so that was the green color the um, point is either included or excluded okay so two times n plus one to the power of d test intervals. Unfortunately, in high dimensions, this is uh, maybe too much to calculate, but um, in theory, it's possible to calculate the discrepancy. So for a one-dimensional sequence, it's, uh, it's uh, easy to calculate the discrepancy. So now, um, what can we do 
with this. And for this, so before I go to the next uh, topic, yeah, or next uh, definition we need, uh, I would like to motivate this by, say, recalling the Monte Carlo uh, convergence rate. So recall our Monte Carlo convergence rate. So how was this? Let me write this down, yeah, so quickly. Uh, so our Monte Carlo convergence rate is, uh, what is the distance of our Monte Carlo integral? So from one to n, f of xi minus the true integral. So I write it in one dimension. So it could be, could be, say, the general case, zero, one to the power of t, yeah? So, um, what's this distance? So take the absolute value. And our Monte Carlo estimate was that the probability, okay, so unfortunately there's a p here in front, that this stays below sigma times one divided by square root of n times one divided by square root of delta. The probability that this stays in this bound is larger than one minus delta. Okay. And uh, you see there are uh, three ingredients here. There is the sigma, yeah? What was the sigma? Remember the sigma? Sigma square is the variance of, uh, let me write this here, the variance of f of x, if x is uniform on zero one. Okay. So then there were, there's this uh, ingredients uh, one divided by square root of delta, which is our confidence uh, level and which is associated with the probability. Um, and there is a second part, it's this one divided by square root of n, which is a property of the sequence. Yeah, so this corresponds to a property of the sequence. Uh, which property? Well, our sequence is a sampling of uniform distributed uh, random numbers. So, um, the variance of one divided by n, the sum, and now let's forget about the f, the sum of xi, yeah? So just the sum of xi, so, xi is independent, the variance is actually one divided by n squared, yeah, because the variance has a square, yeah. then the sum of the variance, so the sum is, it's always the same variance, so it's n times the variance of x, a uniform, and the variance of a uniform on zero one distributed random variable is one divided by 12. Yeah? You can look it up. So this is one divided by 12 times one divided by n. So this is the square root of the variance of the sequence is one divided by square root of 12. Yeah? So some, just some, some constant, one divided by square root of n. So actually 
this one divided by square root of n is the standard deviation of the sequence, the square root of the variance of the sequence, and this sigma is the square root of the variance of the function. It's the function and the sequence. So actually in this equation, in this estimate, you already have one part which is characterizing the function and one part which is characterizing the sequence. So this one divided by square root of n is associated with our sequence, the sequence we used. Um, the thing where I want to go with you is the, 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 um, the theorem uh, is uh, actually building an estimate where this one divided by n is replaced by the discrepancy a property of the sequence. So we need an, another thing to characterize a property of the function. And this property of the function is um, the variation, the total variation of the function. Okay, so to summarize here on this slide, uh, we now have um, the discrepancy and it corresponds to a property of the sequence and for ID random variable, uh, which are uniform, actually um, we have a similar property, which is uh, the um, standard deviation is one divided by square root of n times one divided by square root of 12. Okay, so what we need is some kind of measure for the variation of the function. And uh, this uh, definition is giving us a general definition in uh, D dimension. Um, so this is the variation in the sense of Hardy and Krause. Okay, so let's uh, read the definition together and maybe let's develop some intuition of what's going on here. Yeah, so the uh, function is assumed to be sufficiently smooth. Uh, it's a function on the unit uh, hypercube in D dimensions. And then the variation V of F of this function in the sense of Hardy and Krause is defined by this um, double sum here over some functions v of k, over some functions v of k. So these guys here. So let's have a look at uh, these guys. What is this um, v of k? So there is some k here. So k goes from one to the number of dimensions and this k defines the derivative of the function. So this is the case derivative we take inside this integral. So actually for k equals one, this is the first derivative f with respect to, okay, so now since if f is a function which depends on a d-dimensional vector, um, I have to say with respect to which component I'm differentiating. So, and I'm differentiating with respect to the component x i, uh, in, in that case x i one, in uh, d dimension, and if k is uh, larger uh, than uh, one, uh, so then I take maybe all possible combinations of these indices. So here we have all possible combinations of indices and I'm um, differentiating the function uh, with respect to these indices. Okay, so um, then of this differential, we take the absolute value. Okay, so here we have the absolute value. And we integrate this over the uh, domain. So actually we do not integrate over the full domain. You see there is some um, notation here that we restrict the function on actually only those indices, those components, i1 to ik. So what is this restricted function? So this restricted function f of i1 ik is the function which just depends on x1 to xk. 
And it is our function f of xi with the corresponding xi equal to the xi, but the other component is set to zero. Yeah? So the other component is set to zero. Okay, so actually you are just looking of the function along the edges of your hypercube. Let's make maybe a small example to get a better understanding for this definition. Consider the case D equals one. So we are in one dimension. So in that case, the first sum here, which goes over all the indices of the dimension. So this sum is just one element, maybe K equals one. K equals one means here's our K, the definition of the function VK for K equals one is take the first derivative. Okay, and the index, since D is equal to one, the index is just our index one. So it's just our X one, our X. So this means for D equals one, V of F is just the integral from zero to one, differentiate F with respect to X, take the absolute value dx. Okay, that's just what you would uh, consider as the variation of f. So if your function uh, looks like this, so here's one, here's zero. So the function goes slowly here upwards, but goes only, uh, always upwards. Then it goes downwards, then maybe it goes up again, yeah, and it reaches here the point one. So then if you integrate uh, from zero to say this point, you have a plus one. If you integrate from zero, uh, from that point to this point, yeah, actually you have a minus one, but since we integrate the absolute value, we have another plus one. And if we integrate from this point to that point, we have another plus one, so the V of F is three. So now for two dimensions, actually it's not enough to just look at one horizontal line yeah, because the function could have variation in the other component too. Yeah? So our V of F is, so, we have now the sum from k equals one to two. So two parts, k equals one and k equals two. For k equals one, we take the function v one, which uses the first derivative of the function f restricted to one component, either x one or x two. Yeah, where we set the other component to zero. So this is two integrals, one with the index i1 um, being the first, um, being one, being the x1, and then i1 being the index uh, two, the x2. So we have the integral of a two-dimensional function in one dimension, and we integrate the first, the derivative of f of x1, the other component is zero, with respect to x1 differentiated, dx1. We take the integral in the other component. So this is the second part of this blue sum. So this is df of zero and x2 differentiated with respect to x2, take the absolute value, dx2, 
And then we have also the case k equals two. So it's the double integral of the second derivative of f of x1, x2 with respect to dx1, dx2, dx1, dx2. And here the absolute value. So if you like to have a small picture here, so maybe I have a little bit space here, uh, we have here the x1 and here we have x2. Yeah. So we need to calculate the variation in our domain, yeah, 0, 1 squared. So then the first integral here, so maybe draw this here in light blue. Okay, the first integral is integrating along this line and is looking at how does the function variate, what is the variation of the function along this line. The second integral here is taking the variation along the vertical axis here. Okay, and our integral here is actually now integrating the second derivative of the function absolute value. So over the whole domain. So it's actually integrating over the whole domain. And if you integrate a second derivative, and if you start from the first derivative, the result is actually like, um, it's a double integral, like a single integral over the first derivative. So actually this combination then includes all those lines to some extent. Yeah. So in, in a certain way, all those guys here are then included by this. Okay, and this is measuring the vari variation of the function v of f. Okay, so maybe in, in, in high dimensions, yeah, this looks uh, like a complicated uh, formula, yeah, but uh, for say one dimension is actually just what you would intuitively understand um, as being the variation of the function. So if the function is constant, yeah, this v of f is zero. Okay, so, and now we have both aspects, yeah? So we have something that characterizes what is the variation of the function, and we have something that characterizes the um, sequence. And now we get a surprising uh, result. So the following theorem uh, links uh, our, uh, our uh, approximation error of our um, integration method to this concept of discrepancy. And here it is. So uh, it's the coxma lafka inequality. So if the function f has bounded variation on the unit hypercube in d dimension, then for any sequence on our unit cube, we have that the error of our Monte Carlo approximation. So the difference of the Monte Carlo sum from the true integral in d dimension is smaller than the variation of the function multiplied with the star discrepancy. Okay, so um, yeah, what's, uh, what's the point here? So maybe let's compare this again to our Monte Carlo convergence. So I had this uh, on the other slide, but maybe I just copy it here. So 
there we were also comparing our Monte Carlo sum uh, to the to solution to the interval on the unit hypercube. And what we had is that this was estimated by sigma times the one divided by square root of n times some constant which is associated with our confidence level because all this was only in probability. Okay, and now you have the surprising result here. The stuff here holds point-wise. Yeah, so say point-wise in the sense that there are no um, random variables involved anymore. Actually here also in the way I wrote the Monte Carlo convergence, uh, the xi should be a sequence of IID random variables just to give, um, um, to give the p a proper meaning. Yeah, so actually here you have the capital xi. Yeah, okay. So, but um, the thing here holds point wise. So we have that this is not in probability. Okay, so actually, this is cool stuff because remember uh, we had this um, uh, concept of Monte Carlo and we, we understood that actually the randomness was a, a feature yeah, which break, break, poke up the curse of dimension and which allowed us to add more points in the, and improve it. But it had the bad aspect of uh, converging only in probability and now this is gone. Yeah? So now we have it uh, without the um, probability and um, it's characterized by the discrepancy of the sequence. So this uh, variation of course corresponds to the sigma here. Yeah, so this is uh, the, in stochastic terms, you would say the standard deviation of of f of x. So the variation of f and we have a property of the sequence. Yeah? So the one divided by square root of n corresponds to um, the sequence. Sorry. So. Okay, so. Um, before we now continue the discussion, which is, you see from this equation, it's motivated that we would like to have a sequence for which D star is small. Yeah. Um, let's uh, maybe look a little bit more into the intuition behind this uh, inequality. Uh, for example, this equality inequality is sharp in the following sense that if you have a sequence given, then for any epsilon, you can find a function. Yeah? So given some sequence, then for any sequence and any epsilon, there is a function f which has variation one which means in this, I have less than d star, less or equal to d star. So the error is just the discrepancy. So 
v of f is one, no? then uh, I can find uh, such a function with v of f equal to one that the error is larger the d star minus epsilon. Okay, so um, we have an inequality that it is less or equal d star and we can find a function so that it's larger than d star minus epsilon. So I can explore, uh, I take say a particularly bad function which actually is exactly doing something in the space where the discrepancy is high. Okay, how can we understand this? Uh, well, it's maybe easy to see in the one dimension, yeah? So maybe this is already the proof of this. So if you are in uh, one dimension, say the, this is the zero here, this is the um, one. Uh, maybe I need a little bit more space. So let me move this bit up. Yeah, so like here. So then we have on this line, we have a few points. So we have a few sample points. Yeah, so one here, one there, uh, another one here. Maybe we have a larger interval. Yeah, so where the discrepancy is becoming a bit larger. Okay, like this. And now, um, well, let's draw the function from which we can actually derive the discrepancy. So I take the difference between counting the points divided by the number of points and the Lebesgue measure. So this is here starting then at zero, there's no point. Then my Lebesgue measure is going up with slope equal to one. Yeah? So the measure over the whole line is uh, one. Okay, then when I reach this point, I jump down. Yeah, we jump down by one divided by n. Yeah, so this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So one divided by seven, and we have this uh, function here. Yeah, so which we had before. So the jumps should be maybe of the same size. I don't know if I can draw this quite right here. Yeah, so and then we have a very long line here, and it jumps down. Okay, so maybe my jumps should be a bit larger. Yeah, hmm, I'm cheating a bit. Okay, so maybe like this. Yeah, so <clears throat> okay, so my jumps have to be um, a bit larger. Okay, let's draw it again. <laughs> Some perfection here. So like this. So it goes much down here, maybe even further and we come up here and down, 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 up. Or something like this, okay? Uh, so this green point is here. Okay, so you see that um, this here is an interval of large this large empty space yeah large empty space and uh, our discrepancy is actually this value here because this is the this is the point that has the largest distance the largest distance from our uh, horizontal line yeah so from uh, the uh, expected value Okay, so this here is the D star. Okay, of this sequence. Then the slope of this zigzag curve, the slope of every up, up of every ramp is one. Uh, actually, this here is D star. This is D star. Okay, and if you would have the function which is one for every point to say the left here, 
Yeah, then actually, if you integrate from zero to this point, the Monte Carlo integral of the left-hand side is exactly um, equal uh, to this value. So say if this here is the point, let's let's uh, add a label to this point, x uh, k. Oh no, no, the one, the one, the next one. So this here is x k. Yeah. Then we have that the sum of one. 1 divided by n, okay, from i equals 1 to k. So this is just the sum of all those jumps on the left side of these, um, uh, of, of, of this uh, blue uh, uh, marker. Huh? This is equal to the integral from zero to say, let's call this point, the blue point here, say alpha, I don't care. So zero to alpha indicator function one dx. Yeah? So this is equal to alpha. Okay, so my Monte Carlo integral and the true integral agree from the left, in, for integrated from the left, if I integrate up to this point. Yeah? Okay, so now I just take two different functions. So let's take two different functions. Um, let's take, um, say, the function which is zero here on the whole domain up to this point and then I go sharply upward to one. Okay, so actually this function, the integral of this function is just one minus alpha. Okay, and then as a next function, I take the function going from um, so which color should I take? Maybe I should take here that one. So the function here, the lighter one is going up to here and then I go sharply upward up to one. So this here is say my function F2 and this here is my function F1. And of course you have the integral from uh, zero to one over, so this here should be one equal to one over F one dx is just um, equal to one minus alpha minus some epsilon, yeah, say some epsilon half. The epsilon half is this area which I missed here, okay? So this is epsilon half. And the integral of F2 is just the same, yeah? So it's the same as integrating um, F1, except that there is a region missing yeah? and this region here has, I explained, this has the size D star. This is our discrepancy multiplied with the jump, which is just one. So this is just, the two integrals are the same, but here we are lacking D star. Okay up to a small error, which is maybe also um, epsilon half. So, okay, so this is 
also say a one minus alpha, a one minus alpha minus d star, and now it's plus epsilon squared here, so maybe a different epsilon, epsilon one, epsilon two. Okay, so, and the two integrals differ, if you forget about the epsilon, by d star. But the Monte Carlo integration of the two integrals is the same. Yeah? So we have that the sum i from one to n f1 xi is the same as one to n. So let's uh, add the one divided by n in front, one divided by n. F2 of x2, uh, x, uh, xi, sorry, xi. So the two Monte Carlo integrals are the same. I have that due to this property here, yeah, my Monte Carlo integral over the function f1 is exactly correct yeah, up to the epsilon to the integral from zero to one, F1. And the Monte Carlo integral over F2 differs by d star. So I have found a function, the function F2, which has an error d star minus some epsilon. Okay, so you can construct uh, such a function by um, actually just exploring uh, the point uh, where uh, your uh, function in the uh, discrepancy is zero, and then the next point where the function is exactly equal to the discrepancy. Yeah? And you just uh, integrate a function um, over this domain. And actually I needed two function, yeah, because I'm not allowed to jump down again, yeah, up and down, because then my variation would be two. Yeah? So I, I, I did this with uh, two function and the integral over one function is exactly the same. Okay, so now I believe you have um, a good uh, intuition, a good understanding of the concept of the discrepancy and also of uh, the variation. Yeah. So the inequality allows us to get a nice reasonable approximation of the function um, f. Uh, the variation of the function is given. We cannot change that, yeah, we cannot play uh, around with this. So what we have is the sequence. So we like to have a sequence x1 up to xn with a low discrepancy. Okay, so, and now, for example, the one which we had in the beginning of this lecture, our sequence xi, i divided by n, okay, in our code, I started in zero and then ended in n minus one, but this doesn't matter. So the discrepancy of this sequence Um, so if I start in zero, I have to write x zero to x n minus one. The discrepancy of this sequence is one divided by n. Okay, so clearly if you have the line, oops, the line here, and you draw this function, then here you have Lebesgue measure zero, but you already have uh, one point, 
Yeah, zero is included in the sequence. Uh, so you jump down. Yeah, actually, uh, when when I um, wrote this, I was always jumping down, and then you jump up and you jump down again. So the sequence looks looks like this. Yeah, and so on. And here you connect back. So and this is then the discrepancy here. The largest distance is one divided by n. Okay. So that that's a sequence which has discrepancy one divided by n, and this explains our little experiment here in our Java code, yeah, where we were looking at this integration and with uh, 10 to the seven number of points, we got a 10 to the minus uh, five times 10 to the minus eight. Yeah? And we maybe get some additional approximation accuracy because actually the variation of the function is, uh, um, is to, oh no, what's the variation of the function? Yeah, it's, uh, oh, it's one. Okay. So, um, actually one should maybe check here if the, uh, if this is actually the value which we expect, yeah, because there's a one half here. Interesting. Okay. So, um, that's uh yeah that's here our our uh, our now theorem which replaces the uh, monte carlo convergence rate and we like to have a sequence which has this low discrepancy in monte carlo there was one other aspect we could add an additional point and then um, the accuracy actually improved. So just need one more minute here. So consider this with n equals say three. Okay, so I have three points here. Yeah, so one third is the interval length. And n equals four. So zero is contained in both sequences. Then one half, one over four, three over four. You see that the sequence with n equals four only contains a single point which was in the previous sequence. So actually this is not what we would like to have because when we increase n, I have to resample all points. This is the same bad situation we had for the Simpsons rule. When we increase, we like to increase the accuracy, we have to improve uh, or, or uh, uh, rearrange uh, re, uh, all the points. So actually what we like to have is an infinite sequence. So we have an infinite sequence x1, x2, and so on, such that every subsequence, so for every k, the discrepancy of the first k elements is small. So we can add more points and the discrepancy becomes smaller and smaller with the additional points. 
Okay, so that's uh, the end of uh, today's uh, lecture. This motivates the so-called low discrepancy sequences. So find infinite sequence with small discrepancy.